Welcome back. Welcome back to this, our 55th show. And live stu from studios in London, as you can probably see. There's a slight feedback in my ear, but have no worries. We're all here. We're all ready to go. Delighted to be joined today by some familiar and very welcome faces. They've been guests of ours before. Uh, here in the studio, Dr. Ramsey Baroud and Dr. Garda Kami. Dr. Kami has come from North London today. She's had a bit of a travail getting in here. She's not going to tell us about that today, though. And we're going to have our guest in Haifa, Professor Ilan Pape. Welcome, Ilan. Welcome, Gala. Welcome, Ramsey. Fantastic to see you all. Um, we're, ve we're very lucky because what we're getting is a sneak preview, really, of the book, this book, that uh, I believe you're launching it here in London uh, on Friday. Uh, as you can see, uh, our vision for the liberation, Ramsey Baroud, Ilan Pape, uh, gets a fantastic uh, endorsement by Roger Waters. This is a fascinating, a great book, says Roger Waters, founding member of Pink Floyd. The title of the book is Engaged Palestinians, Leaders and Intellectuals Speak Out. And today we're going to be talking about the book, about its authors, uh, about what brought our three uh, authors together today. Uh, how it is that they came up with this fantastic idea for this book, this very powerful set of essays. We're going to explore all of that and contemporary issues as well. Uh, I don't think we're going to have Ilan with us for all that long, uh, so we will go to him first. I should just say, that just for, for, most of you will, of course, know Ramsey, you'll know Garda, you'll know Ilan, but just for those who don't, uh, Ramsey is, of course, editor of the Palestine Chronicle. He's an author. I think, uh, as we know, of course he's an author, but he's also an author of at least another five books. And Garda is a Palestinian-born academic physician and author. Uh, Ilan is an expatriate Israeli historian and a professor with the College of Social Sciences and International Studies at the University of Exeter. And I'm Mark Seddon. Uh, I used to be a UN correspondent for Al Jazeera television. I worked for the United Nations a number of years. Uh, now, of course, we're very keen to hear from all of you out there. We apologize for the slight delay starting. However, we want to hear from as many of you as possible. Please do send in your questions. Tell us where you're from, where you're calling from, where you're writing from. Uh, our guests are very keen to hear from all of you. So I'm, what I'm going to do first of all, Ilan in Haifa, can you hear me? I Welcome. can hear you very well. I can That's hear fantastic. you very well. You don't have... Alan, it's so kind of you to join us again. It's wonderful to see you. Uh, thank thank you. you. And I just, because you're not going to be here with us quite so long today. I will try and um, be as, as long as I can. Yes. Oh, well, thank you very much. Thank okay. you. I just really wanted, for, for background, really, we've got all three of you here. You're, I mean, you're with us in spirit. But uh, Garda and Ramsey are here on the, on the sofa. It's beginning to feel a bit like breakfast television here. <laughs> but what I wanted to know, uh, Ilan, is, you know, what brought all three of you together? What gave you this idea for the book? Well, first of all, uh, Radha and I know each other uh, for many, many years. Uh, and uh, when Ramsey and I conceived the idea of the book, uh, she was uh, a very clear candidate as a contributor uh, to, to, to our book. The idea... Uh, I think evolved in the last two or three years uh, after many uh, occasions in which uh, Ramsey and I shared a podium uh, and uh, in panels, in workshop, uh, in seminars. I should say that we worked also together uh, in Exeter, uh, Ramsey and I. Uh, and uh, it, it was a sense that while there is a lot of information about the oppression, about the brutality of the Israeli uh, uh, policy, whether analyzing it in the past or understanding it in the present, there was a sense that the Palestinian agency in all of this is sometimes forgotten. Uh, I think also the uh, obvious disunity in the Palestinian leadership, a sense of disorientation that cannot be hid, hidden. 
uh, is clearly there. Sometimes obfuscates uh, the very individual bravery and resilience uh, that is taking place uh, all over Palestine or wherever the Palestinians are on the globe. And, and we thought that uh, the first mission was to show, first of all, how this resilience, resistance, sometimes very personal, not as part of an organization, sometimes as part of a larger movement, is a daily occurrence, which uh, gives us a lot of hope that uh, uh, there is still a Palestinian liberation movement, even if from an institutional point of view, uh, it seems sometimes that it does not exist. I think a second uh, a, a mission for us was to look at the history of veteran, more veteran Palestinians, like Doc, Dr. Kami, like Rada, uh, to understand that although 48, for instance, or 67 for that matter, were traumatic events, uh, and you cannot undo traumas. Traumas ha have happened. Uh, but how people individually did not let these traumas to define them and were able to build a new life for themselves instead of the life that was destroyed and taken from them in many ways, uh, but not just for the sake of a professional or individual career, but all the time intertwining the personal uh, resurgence of humanity with a continued commitment to the Palestinian uh, liberation. So uh, we, we felt we knew so many people who underwent both processes in the present and in the past, we thought we should share their stories in their own voices uh, with as many people as possible. Well, Ilan, I mean, there's, you've got a lot of endorsements for the book, um, including from our great friend Ronnie Casserles, who is going to be here with us today. We had hoped he's, he sends his apologies, actually, because he's had to go to Belfast. Um, but Ronnie says, uh, read this book. You'll be strengthened and inspired. It's a death knell to the Zionist fantasies, fantasy and imperialist domination. Every page breathes a scent of freedom sooner than is thought. Uh, Ken Loach says... This book deserves a warm welcome. It celebrates the achievements of Palestinians and the rich diversity of their culture. Clearly, their spirit of resistance is alive and well. And Vijay Prashad, Indian historian, of course, says it's so important to pay attention to the brave and smart voices of Palestinians, those particularly who are active every day to bring decency and justice into a world getting uglier by the day. So whilst you're with us uh, still, Ilan, I mean, can, can you... How do you, with all the people that you could call upon to contribute to this volume, to this book, how did you go about pulling people together? Well, we, we wanted, uh, first of all, to make sure that we represent all the geographical locations in which Palestinians today live. Uh, we wanted to make sure that we have a fair representation of generation, of gender, uh, locations in historical uh, Palestine uh, itself. And I'm sure we could have done a book of 70 uh, such uh, um, recollections and, and, and testimonies for resilience, resistance, and uh, which really uh, uh, make us all hopeful after reading uh, those uh, contributions. Uh, but I think we, we, we understood that, um, in fact, everyone we are approaching is very willing to contribute. So uh, we hardly got any, if I, Ramsey will correct me, but I don't remember getting any real uh, negative reaction. So eventually we needed uh, uh, to decide, uh, you know, so that the book would be manageable and readable, not to put everyone. But this just shows you that on an individual level, uh, whether Palestinians are in Australia, in uh, Chile, in the Yarmouk uh, uh, refugee camp or what is left of it, uh, in East Jerusalem or in London, uh, they share a lot. Uh, and, and it really, uh, I, I think what brought them together, as, as far as I can see it, is that while I myself in my lecture as, as an historian, not just as an activist, do talk about this unity in the Palestinian leadership, in Palest in the, on, the, on the Palestinian political scene, actually what the reactions we got prove to us that there is a lot of unity on the Palestinian side. In fact, 
that this unity is not at the level of people, of societies, of individuals in Palestinian civil societies. It's quite incredible, you know, Dr. Carmi for many, many years advocated the one state solution, uh, long before many of us uh, deserted the, uh, uh, the idea of a two state solution. It seems that so many Palestinians uh, at whatever age, from whatever gender and from whatever uh, location, historical Palestine, it seems natural to them to, to talk about the liberation of Palestine in terms of decolonization of the whole of historical Palestine, uh, clearly stating their support for the right uh, of return, clearly hoping for a vision of uh, a decolonized and de-Zionized uh, Palestine without being utopians or romanticics or romanticizing this, namely not being aware of the present imbalance of power and its problems and its challenges, but uh, still uh, are motivated by a common vision of liberation. So on the one hand, it's a common vision, but uh, I think what is not common, which makes it so exciting to read, I think, is the different ways in which people believe they themselves contributed or contribute to the uh, realization of this vision and how optimistic and how far do they think they would be able to see this vision uh, realized on the ground in their lifetime or in the next generation? Well, thank you, Ella. I'm, I'm just going to ask you one final question before I turn to Garda. Um, you're an Israeli historian, and of course, I'm sure you would say that um, Israelis shouldn't see uh, a threat in this. They should see opportunity in this. But do you some did you come under any personal pressure? from people not to take part, not to not to be part of this project? Do you do you come under pressure a lot of the time from from other Israelis saying this isn't our vision? Well, it, it's too late to ask this question. I've been at it now for 40 years. Uh, I don't think I even notice when the pressure is there or the condemnation or the people calling me a, a traitor or self-hating Jew or if there are threats. Uh, that's all behind me, really. I mean, I've, I've been so many years in it. Of course, at the beginning, when you do the transition from uh, the comfort zone of a privileged position within the Israeli society to where I am today, uh, in the transition stage, you are exposed, you are uh, threatened, uh, but you always remind yourself that the price you pay is very uh, uh, small compared to the price Palestinians pay. Um, but I think you, you ask a, a different, uh, also another question. Uh, do, what do I tell the Israelis about such, such a vision? I, I never tell them, by the way, that this is uh, all very good for them. I, I don't like to, to lie to people. I think people who have privileges, so many privileges for so many years, uh, would find it difficult to give up these privileges. Uh, and I always think, uh, and I, I remember Franz Fanon says it, he says it very clearly. He said that decolonization is a messy process. It's not a, a walk in the Rosengarten. Uh, uh, it's not a picnic uh, in the wild where everybody enjoys themselves. The people who had the privileges, who uh, uh, robbed other people's lands, dispossessed them and so on, are going to pay in one way or another. But I think in the long run for everyone, uh, who lives in historical Palestine. This is a far better vision of life than the present one. Uh, but I'm, I'm very careful of telling the Israelis that this is a painful visit if you want to the dentist in order to get rid of a really uh, dangerous, uh, it's more than a dentist actually, you know, of a really dangerous uh, uh, illness. Um, so um, yes, I, I do think Israelis would find it difficult. I don't think they like the messengers who give them these messages, uh, but I don't think it depends on them. You know, if I may just add one sentence, I've been asked recently, I don't know why this uh, question comes more and more in recent uh, interviews I gave to the press in the last months in the wake of this book and other events, I was asked, do you think uh, that it's possible to, to liberate uh, Palestine without the help of the Israeli left? And my answer is uh, that uh, you can, of course, liberate Palestine without the Israeli left or the Israeli uh, uh, liberals. Uh, it would be good to do it with them, but it's not necessary to do it with them. 
And um, uh, this is something that is very important to, to remember and not to be hindered by uh, an attempt to wait for a significant change within the Israeli Jewish society as a precondition for changing the reality on the ground. Thank you very much, Ilan. Well, Gada, if I may turn to you, uh, just before I do, published, I think the launch is on Friday, but the title, of course, Our Vision for Liberation, Engage Palestinian Leaders and Intellectuals Speak Out. Well, I mean, I was quite interested in this because it's rare that you you, you actually see the, the word intellectual attached to a book, in a way. <laughs> and I, I suppose the question might be, because we, we live in increasingly dumbed down times in, in many ways. Um, you're talking about engaged intellectuals and leaders. So, th of course, the leaders and the intellectuals come from all walks of life within Palestine. But did you think that some people might think this is a bit exclusive as a title? Or by the way, what, was, what was the thinking behind the title? Well, <clears throat> uh, I didn't choose the title, but I must say it's very brave. To, as you point out, to actually include the word intellectual at a time and in a context in which there is an anti-intellectual movement is, is, is very courageous. But it's the truth. Uh, it's the truth and it has to be said. Palestine, like many other nations, has its own uh, class of people who think about things, which is what an intellectual is. And... Um, D debate within themselves and with others what is the best way forward for whatever it is that they're concerned about. Um, yes, it's courageous and it's correct. And when you talk about liberation as authors, I mean, what do you actually mean? Because I think when many people think about liberation, they have in their own mind's eye perhaps uh, Mandela being released from prison, South Africans getting the vote all South Africans getting the vote. Um, but it's clear from the book, actually, that liberation has different meanings for different peoples. Uh, so what is your take? What, is, what does liberation mean for a Palestinian? Uh, I Honestly, I don't know about these different takes, but I tell you, I think that there is this unity that Ilan Papi spoke about in the idea, in the belief that liberation means regaining Palestine. It's very simple. No Palestinian uh, ever really accepted the loss of the homeland. Um, none of us ever believes or thinks that it's gone forever. Um, and, and I'm sure I'm right. That I haven't done a survey, but I'm sure I'm right in my encounters with fellow Palestinians, in what one sees, what one hears. The idea that Palestinians have carried all these years since 1948 is the idea that it cannot go on forever. By it, I mean Israel. This injustice cannot go on forever. And it's a very um, vivid thing felt by Palestinians. It's not a slogan uh, to say, you know, this injustice cannot prevail because people feel it very strongly. They, they know there is a homeland. It's sitting there and other people are in it. Uh, and, and saying it's theirs, it's not acceptable, and nobody else. So liberation for me, and I think m most Palestinians, means regaining Palestine. And when I was talking to Ilan a few moments ago, he was saying that you were one of the very, well, you were many, many years ago, you were talking about a one-state solution. So essentially what I guess all of the authors are talking about in this book is a historic Palestine. Uh, a one-state solution, a secular democratic Palestine, uh, not just the occupied territories. No. So the question, I suppose, is, did, did you feel from your involvement with this book and with the other contributors that you actually laid out a roadmap for how this could actually happen? Well, um, well first of all, on in terms of the one-state idea, um, yes, indeed, I was writing about this many, many years ago. 
not because I was sitting there trying to find a blueprint for a democratic um, uh, structure which would include, um, you know, all the inhabitants and so on. Of course, that was implied, but my own, but the impetus for it, and and I'm sure the impetus in 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 the Palestinian mind is what I've just talked about, regaining Palestine. You know, it's so. So, in other words. The starting point says, uh, I cannot and I will never accept the occupation and the loss of my country. Second step, I will fight. I believe it to be the right thing to do, and I will fight for to, to regain that homeland. Those are very simple to understand. Uh, now, then you come to this, only then do you come to the third stage where you say, all right, what are we really talking about here? We do have a, an Israeli Jewish population sitting in my homeland. That is a fact. Um, they need accommodating. Um, and there has to be a way in which they can be accommodated, and we, that is not only the we Palestinians who are living already in, in historic Palestine, but all the Palestinians who are living outside it, who are exiled, or who are sitting in refugee camps, people like me. How can we accommodate this? How can mm. we realistically do it? Well, quite clearly, it has to be, uh, there's no divisions. You won't, can't partition Palestine. The people have to live together. How are they going to live together? Ideally, of course, as one person, one vote in a democracy with equal rights. Now, I think maybe my own contribution in the chapter that I wrote is to really very seriously engage with how. Because, you know, a lot of people write about the one state and it's very good and it's very desirable. But if you say, well, how are we going to get there? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there is um, usually a silence. And in, in my chapter, I put forward a very controversial uh, way of getting there, which um, um, for which when I've lectured on this, I've been branded a traitor, uh, somebody who denies the history of resistance on the part of uh, all the, the sacrifice that Palestinians have made, that kind of thing. <clears throat> but it is a way of trying to, 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 to attain this end. Um, now, I don't know whether you want me to go on and talk about that. Well, we will certainly come back to that if we may. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanted to bring in Ramsey because uh, whilst we were just talking then, I was also thinking about historic Palestine. And of course, if you go to the United Nations, as you know, they have the trusteeship council. Mm -hmm. It's redundant now virtually. But it struck me when I was thinking about uh, our conversation today that if you look at the the mandated territories at the end of the First World War, the end of the Ottoman Empire, the defeat of the German Empire, uh, all of those mandated territories have since gained their independence, um, possibly with the exception of Micronesia in the Pacific. But Palestine hasn't. So we start from that premise that Palestine was never given its independence. So, you know, looking from that historic reality you know is there not a much more simpler way to be arguing for palestinian independence and freedom based on that of experience of other countries such as southwest africa namibia for instance of course and this has been quite a dominant uh, view among palestinians is that we have always been made the exception i mean we uh, we we've been discussing this sometimes at, a, at an intellectual level why is Palestine the, the exception as far as many Western intellectuals are concerned? And we see this highlighted in the case of Ukraine versus Russia. Mm. Quite often, again, the Palestinians are being made the exception. This goes back a long, long time ago, over a century. But I think what we try to actually achieve from this book, uh, and, and it's back to your question about the, the title, is that we, we were thinking of liberation at two different levels, the actual act of liberation, uh, the ending of the occupation, the dismantling of apartheid, uh, and, 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 and for Palestinians to be given basic human rights, to be treated 
as citizens in a territory that they can identify with and and the rest of it, that we're all familiar with it. But there is a different kind of liberation that we were aiming for. And this is why I think some of our 30 contributors may have discussed liberation from a different point of view, which is the liberation of the discourse itself, mm -hmm. the liberation of the language itself, the liberation of how we locate ourselves as Palestinians. Sadly, in many ways, we are trapped in, in pro-Israeli Zionist priorities. And we have been, even within the pro-Palestine community, been forced to often contend with the fact that the story is quite often told from the Israeli Zionist point of view. And as a result, we always have to kind of backtrack and try to respond, defend ourselves. We're not terrorists. We are not all terrorists. We haven't all elected Hamas. Well, it goes back much earlier than that. We don't want to throw the Jews into the sea, as was the, the cliche during the times of Jamal Abdel Nasser. And all of this. So we're always kind of, in some ways, being perceived to be the aggressor, which makes absolutely no sense, being that the ones we are the ones who are colonized and aggressed upon and constantly trying to fight not only for for the freedom to move about or the freedom, but for our own survival, as we have seen in the case of Gaza. 98% of the water in Gaza, for example, is polluted. We are talking about an existential crisis here. Uh, yet somehow we have always been the ones who have to answer the difficult questions, as if we are the ones who actually created this conflict, not the Balfour Declaration, not Britain, not the, the uh, American weapons of uh, uh, nearly $4 billion a year to Israel, not the U.S. Congress. No, it's the Palestinians, besieged Palestinians living in cantons and, and, and be behind apartheid walls and under siege in the Gaza Strip. So we wanted to say, if we as Palestinians imagine a different narrative in which the story is told from our point of view, what would it look like? What would the story be if it's based entirely on Palestinian priorities? Not in a cliche, sentimental sort of way, but rather in very specific people with programs. Rada was quite courageous in her chapter. Others also took on various issues, whether in art and cinema, in, in embroidery, in science, in archaeology, in diplomacy, uh, and all of these issues kind of talking about them. This is how we have been doing it. This is what we learned. These are the mistakes that have been committed. This is what we think is the proper way forward. Thank you, Ramsey. I'm, I'm with uh, Ramsey Baroud uh, and uh, Gala Karma and Ilan Pape, who's in Haifa. And today we're talking about their book, Our Vision for Liberation. Many other contributors as well. It's being launched on Friday. Um, we'll... Uh, will actually remind you towards the end of the of the publisher uh, for you to get your own copy. But I just wanted to come back to you on some of this, Ramsey. Do you think um, from some of the contributions in this book, there are there are ways, new ways that are being set out for liberation? Because you get the impression uh, that the rest of the world is often ca playing catch up. We've seen this past year uh, I suppose language, you're talking about language just then, language of apartheid, uh, now being widely used by international agencies, by, by media, by all manner of organizations in a way that wouldn't have happened four or five years ago. Um, we're talking about settler colonialism, for instance. This is language that was rejected. Oh, this is terrible. You can't say these sorts of things. But now, really into the mainstream, a lot of this language is in the mainstream now. And in a, in a way... Could you sort of compare this, the situation with the last days of apartheid South Africa? Because you saw in, in so many of the Western responses to demands for liberation from South Africa, the same kind of resistance. Do you feel, do the contributors to your book, do you think, feel that we're in a, a different situation? The world might be playing catch up, but the agenda is, you are leading an agenda, an agenda. And what is new that's coming out of this book, would you say, that's helping to lead that? Agenda? That's right. Indeed, there is this, I wouldn't call it euphoria per se, but there is a feeling that this time around things are different. Um, 
of course, much of, of, of this euphoria might be related to what took place in May 2021, which itself is the culmination of, a pro of processes that have been in the making for years. When Oslo was signed in 1993, we quite often talk about Oslo as, as a political doctrine, but we rarely discuss Oslo as a culture where Palestinians were told that in order for you to be accepted within the realm of good, moderate nations, you have to behave in a certain way. And you have to speak in a certain way as well. There are certain terminologies like liberation, freedom fighting, resistance, mukawama. We were not allowed to use those terms anymore. The terms that we were supposed to use, the peace process, only two state solutions, we can't venture out uh, of this stifling paradigm that was really never meant to actualize in the first place. There was the good Palestinians, the bad Palestinians, the terrorist sympathizers versus the moderate friendly ones. And at the end of the day, of course, that got us nowhere. Nor did we actually, many of us, many of the engaged intellectuals of Palestine, including the likes of Professor Karmi, Professor Edward Said, and others, they argued from the very start <laughs> That this is not going to deliver, you know, the, you know, get us to that coveted just peace. Uh, but many Palestinians sadly played along and they were financed pretty well. It's the Palestinian Authority, of course. Now, all these decades later, there is this changing language among Palestinians. If we notice what happened between May of last year and May of this year, how the young people, that young generation of Palestine from Haifa and Yaffa, to Sheikh Jarrah, to Gaza, to Nablus and Jenin, but also beyond that, Ain al Hilwi in Lebanon and elsewhere, that you kind of see there's this unified new language that is not factional in its nature, as has been the case for a long time. Very little discussion about Hamas and Fatah, who's right and who's wrong. Very few people have been protesting or rallying, for example, around the political unity between the, fac the factions. It's like they have discovered that actually unity is the unity of values, the unity of purpose, the unity of the people on the street. And that's the kind of unity that we are actually seeing actualizing in Palestine as we speak. Thank you, Ramsey. I don't know. Ilan, are you still with us in Haifa? Ilan? Yes, I am with you. Oh, fantastic. Welcome back. Thank you very much. I'm there. I, for I being with us. <laughs> so many other temptations to take you away. But no, you're still no, with no, us. No, That's no, no. I'm totally there. Um, Ilan, we've just been talking about these different visions for uh, liberation uh, and the fact that this book does not come at all of this just for uh, the liberation of the West Bank of Gaza, of East Jerusalem, the occupied territories. It's the whole of historic Palestine. You were talking about that a little bit earlier. Um, and I was quite interested to see that in drawing up uh, your contributors, you I think you chose about 48 people who live in Israel. And I wondered if you could tell us something about them. Um, and also if all of them are coming to this from the same kind of angle. Uh, and you know, how, how it was that really you managed to get such a disparate group of uh, people with, I mean, Garda was talking about what she's been saying. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting debate going on uh, amongst many Palestinians too about the way forward. But I'm interested in the 48 people that you chose from within Israel. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's very clear that one of the main purpose of the Zionist uh, uh, project and later the state of Israel, was to fragment the Palestinians into small groups, as small as possible, and to create the impression that these are distinct uh, Palestinian groups with different agendas uh, that Israel as a colonial power could manipulate through policies of uh, divide and rule. And uh, it's a very powerful uh, methodology to try and break down the spirit of liberation of a nation. And uh, for many years, I think even some Palestinians and definitely quite a lot of people in the Arab world believe that the Israelis at least succeeded in uh, totally uh, domiciling, uh, oppressing, silencing the uh, 48 Arabs who are now about a million and a half and even more 
uh, uh, people. And I think what the stories that we have and the evidence and the, and the visions of liberation coming from the 48 Arabs show us that despite of 74 years living in, uh, first of all, under a very harsh military rule until 1966, and then living under what Amnesty International correctly framed as an apartheid system, despite of all that, uh, and the uh, policy uh, of oppression and, and, and fragmentation, the vision is a general uh, vision. If you draw it uh, with, in general terms, is not different from the vision that uh, Rada talked about, uh, what she called the, the, the basic Palestinian impulse of liberation. is very much alive among the 48 Arabs. Uh, they are in a difficult position, there's no doubt about it, but it was very interesting to see how many of our contributors who come from there explain so clearly in such a lucid way how they navigate uh, between the very particular reality in which they live uh, and the total commitment to the Palestinian cause and to the vision of liberation. Because you have to remember, Israel is using their presence as uh, the most important proof that it is the only democracy uh, in the Middle East because they are allowed, allegedly allowed to vote and allowed to be elected to the Israeli Knesset, the Israeli parliament. And there are so many uh, uh, unseen uh, sides of the Israeli apartheid towards them that they find it difficult sometimes even to convince uh, other Palestinians and other people in the Arab world that they are not less oppressed than any Palestinian in the West Bank, in the Gaza Strip, or outside uh, the boundaries of, of, of the homeland. And, and you can see how they navigate between this intimidation on the one hand and temptation to be drawn into playing the role uh, the Israelis and especially the liberal Israelis want them to play without giving up their dignity, their fully understand, the, the, the full understanding that uh, occupation can have uh, occupation and colonization is more than one way of uh, uh, expressing itself. And um, they have a lot of work to do in that respect because they seem to be naturalized, but they're totally not naturalized by the Israelis. They seem to normalize their relationship with the Jewish state on a daily basis because they live there and pay taxes and go to the schools and universities, but they are not normalizing that. They are not giving up the impulse that the Rada was talking about. And I, th I thought that their particular contribution was very important to show that they are, as they say in Arabic, Jews they are an integral part of the Palestinian people, despite being targeted more than any other group by the Israelis to play a historical role that would really uh, uh, provide a moral shield to the uh, inhumanity that Israel has wreaked uh, in Palestine since the arrival of the Zionist uh, movement in the late 19th century. Thank you, Ilan. Now we are looking for all of you to send in your questions, make some points uh, to our guests here and also to Ilan, still in Haifa. Uh, we do have a question here. This is um, Derek uh, in Manchester, in Northern England. This one for you, Ilan. Is this a manifesto, he's referring to the book, is this a manifesto for change or more a history of what's already been tried by Palestinian leaders and intellectuals? Well, I think it's both. First of all, it's a record. It's recording through individual stories, a humanizing story. You have to remember how often in Western media and in the dominate discourse of the Western academia and politics, the Palestinians are dehumanized. They don't, they don't appear as, as, as regular human beings. So it's a record of people with faces, names, and stories of what has been achieved already. But of course, it is, and I'm not sure it's a manifesto, but it's a clear declaration that whoever thought that the Palestinians are going to give up on liberation, just because in, that partic in this particular moment, in 2022, the imbalance on power on the ground looks impossible. Uh, and the international community, especially the political elites, seem to be indifferent at best 
and hostile at worst, it doesn't mean that the struggle would stop for a day. And in a historical perspective, it is very clear that each individual contribution to the liberation struggle accumulates and will fuse into a much broader uh, and uh, uh, well-coordinated uh, effort in the future. Uh, Ramsey mentioned the Intifada of the Unity uh, last May, in May 2021. Uh, this was, I think, an indication uh, what Israel is going to face uh, with all its military might. I would just re mention one thing here that is very important, and, and this comes out in, in several of the contribution. The Palestinian society is one of the youngest in the world. 50% uh, of the Palestinians, wherever they are, 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 are under 18 years old. Uh, you, should you talk to Palestinian teenagers uh, all over, wherever they are, and you understand that this is an assertive generation that would continue uh, the struggle of liberation. And with the way Israel is going to uh, evolve, it's very clear uh, what's going on on the ground in Israel, the way it's going to evolve, uh, uh, giving up on the democratic charade anyway, and really becoming an official apartheid state, uh, I think that this is more than a manifesto. This is a determination, a statement of determination to continue the struggle of liberation with a clear language that Ramsey was talking about, which enables to chart very clearly and genuinely uh, an, uh, an end, a solution that is much, much more authentic and realistic than anything the Western diplomacy under American leadership has offered for many years as a so-called peace in Israel and Palestine. Thank you, Elad. Well, as I said, we are looking for you to send questions and points in. Uh, Lily in Glasgow in Scotland has just done that. Uh, she says, this book seems so important and timely. Thank you, Ramsey and Elan, for putting it together. Uh, so the question for you, Ramsey, how can we help amplify the wealth of ideas and messages in it to reach people? <clears throat> Apart from buy it, of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, once you buy it, I think the second point is going to be uh, to remember that at the end of the day, it is the, the the centrality of the Palestinian voice and the Palestinian narrative that should dominate any discourse on liberation. We can't be on the sidelines in a discussion about us. And, you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. Quite often, we find ourselves an audience to someone else's conversation about us. Think about it this way, for example, in U.S. Senate hearings, Quite often you have discussions on Palestine in which the expert is pro-Israel and the defender of Palestinians may be anti-Zionist Jewish scholar and the ones who are making the judgment are mostly white men, uh, American men, and the Palestinian is not even present even though the discussion is essentially about Palestine. This has kind of pretty much been the dominant way of digesting, dissecting, and understanding Palestine in the West. And quite often, we actually find this ailment in our own solidarity movement because we are being told, well, you see, because of the way you are depicted in the media, we become almost like a liability to ourselves. But the truth is, I mean, those 30 top intellectuals who have been living, I mean, engaged intellectuals, living the experience on a daily basis for decades, these people are a small sampling of a much larger intellectual body of Palestinians in Palestine and across the world. I think we can be, in fact, we are more than qualified to represent ourselves. So I think that should be a starting point once you read the book is to try to imagine what would the discourse be with Palestinians sitting at the heart of it and communicating the main message. And also there is an implicit message in the book about solidarity. In fact, if you notice that all the endorsements come from non-Palestinians mm -hmm. and all the contributions come from Palestinians, as if we are trying to say there is a message there. Solidarity is not when you take my place, solidarity is when you stand by my side and try to create networks, support me, help me to communicate my message, but not to replace me. And I think that that comes quite clear throughout the book. Thank you, Ramsey. Coming to you, Carter. We touched on this a little bit earlier, but I really wanted to follow up with you and talk about, I suppose, what you could describe as being the elephant in the room, 
Um, we don't have a real elephant in the room, but the elephant in the room is possibly the official Palestinian political leadership. And I know that the book addresses liberation in so many different ways, and it's not a focus on just the politics of the situation. But um, the criticism is, as you well know, you made it very often yourself. The Palestinian leadership is currently split, is often seen as being authoritarian, and it's also being seen as divided and weak. Um, I mean, you cast your mind back to the days of Chairman Yasser Arafat and the Palestine Liberation Organization was a real force on the world stage in the United Nations and elsewhere. So what has to be done? What has to happen to get the, the political leadership you need in Palestine? Well, you've packed a lot in there. Um, certainly the Palestine Liberation Organization, which I lived through, uh, how it was first established and what it did, and, it, and, and it's the, the, the um, achievements it had, really, particularly in the late 1960s. So they put Palestine back on the map. Um, I can't uh, overestimate the importance of the PLO, and of course, they were the ones who came up with the one state idea, which now people talk about as if it was some, some innovation, but it wasn't. It was put forward by the PLO in 1969. They, they had this wonderful vision. Um, unfortunately, we know the history that it didn't come to anything. Now, in terms of the PA, you see, it could not be otherwise. A body, a legislative body, whatever it calls itself, set up under colonial occupation, cannot be, cannot answer to the needs of the Palestinians, and it cannot be much better than it is. I mean, you could argue it could be less corrupt, it could be um, um, more um, braver in, in facing down the Israelis and putting the case on the world stage and so on. But really, I don't think it could be expected to do much more because one must understand that um, uh, organizations set up in an, in an occupied territory by permission of the occupiers with the, uh, uh, with the agreement of the occupiers unless you know, that authority or that uh, leadership starts to uh, uh, stray from, from the accepted line, then being put back in its box. I don't really expect very much else from them. So Can I go back to you on that, Carter, because I was just, as you were saying that, I was thinking about the, uh, the, the British colonial administrations in Hong Kong, the legislative council there, the brave leadership that came out of that, arguably. Also, you could look at Kenya uh, and other places where there was settler colonialism. And these legislative councils, however weak or control they might have been to be set up, they did provide a kind of, there was a leadership there. There was a desire to move beyond that to independence. What you don't really see at the moment, it seems, is uh, a united Palestinian leadership, both at the PA and uh, in Gaza, and it's, it's just not there. So how do you get that? Exactly. I mean, we do have some very fundamental problems. We have to face it. The, the First of all, if you have to, ha if you have a, a, a political movement in any struggle, you have to have some basic things. First, that the goal is agreed. What is the goal of the Palestinian struggle? What is it? You know, the goal has to be agreed. Secondly, the method has to be agreed. Once you've agreed the goal, then you have to agree on the ways in which you get there. We are far from that in, in Palestinian terms. And by the way, I, do, I did not mean to imply that because you've got a Palestinian leadership in the context of colonial uh, occupation, that it, it's completely hopeless, that it has no future. No, indeed, these things can give rise to, but it has to change. It has to fundamentally alter for it to provide the sort of leadership that Palestinians are looking for. And uh, the, the question of how do you get there, um, you see, I think there has to be a popular grassroots movement arising inside Palestine, historic Palestine. However much Ramsey and I uh, can jump up and down and talk about what should happen, we cannot make it happen, not from here. 
they have to lead, they have to lead it, the people on the ground. And what I foresee or I imagine is a grassroots movement which is unified in the aim it wants, what it wants to achieve, and then the PA or anybody that uh, collaborates with the occupier becomes irrelevant. So in that way, you make it irrelevant. You can't fight it and remove it. And that's what has to happen. Now, you might well ask, there's a lot of uh, question marks in what I've just said. Well, what is the unified aim? And who's to say that um, uh, the, 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 the grassroots, that's the, the people under current occupation, um, look at the poor people of Gaza, are these people in a condition to rise up and get together in a movement. Now, I think you see the point that Ramsey made very correctly. I've really begun to feel hopeful. I think this is beginning to happen. Because if you look at the events of May 2021, uh, that's the start. You could see it as the start of a unified movement on the ground mm -hmm. within historic Palestine, which is where it has to start. So can, what, I, can I come? Sorry, I beg your pardon. But can I come to you on this, Ramsey? As the, the same question, um, but but also reflecting on that election that never was in the Palestine Authority, the fact that most Palestinians you spoke to had huge uh, optimism and hope that there would be elections, there would be a change of leadership. Those elections never took place. So from what Garda was saying about well, it becomes more irrelevant to the PA and the leadership because it's what well, but. It still must be a central demand of people to have their representatives uh, actually face election and to get new leadership in when it's needed. That's right. The Palestinian people are historically been in a very, very tough spot. On the one hand, they seem to agree consistently throughout the years before Oslo, after Oslo, for example, on the centrality of resistance, uh, even armed resistance in Palestine. Majority of Palestinians, 63%, for example, <clears throat> agree that armed resistance is legitimate and it should be not just in Gaza but in the West Bank as well. We may agree or disagree, that's just open for, for discussion, but when you look at the Palestinian people on the street, there hasn't been fundamental disagreements on their, what is, could, you know, what what their rights are, what they include and what they don't include. The difficult part has been, uh, as, as Ghada mentioned, 1969, that was the what the PLO has championed, coexistence, one state for all people or religions. And that kind of was maintained to be the position until Henry Kissinger began doing his shuttle diplomacy and the Arabs began pushing the PLO and Yasser Arafat to change that position. Uh, and the Americans conditioned any engagement with the PLO. Eventually, they engaged with them in Tunisia, these low-level diplomatic talks, on the idea that you have to abandon any illusions that there will ever be that one state. And only 242-338 UN resolutions that matters and the discussion would have to be contained within those parameters, but even at that, none of these parameters have been achieved anyway. So Palestinians began kind of getting divided. There was a lot of hope and faith in Yasser Arafat and his leadership that, well, we call him Lichtiar, the old man. The old man knows what he's doing. Maybe it doesn't make sense to us, but the old man knows what he's doing. Well, sadly, it turned out that the old man maybe did not know perfectly what he was doing. And that's where the division among Palestinians over what we actually want or that objective that Ghada was referring to. Now, according to a recent public opinion poll, majority of Palestinians in the West Bank support a one-state solution. And that critical mass is about to be reached in Gaza. And that happened within you know, relatively a very short period of time. So if these indicators continue, at, th at this level, it seems that sooner or later, Palestinians will back this particular solution and we will then speak about an objective that is being championed by the Palestinian people. Now, the question is, will we ever have that leadership that is going to support the people's position? Uh, Edward Said had that famous statement in which he said, Palestinians are cursed by a bad leadership. 
and far from trying to correct Professor Said in any possible way, but I don't think it's really the matter of bad leadership per se, as much as we had no other alternative but to have that bad le leadership. Because our good leadership is either in prison, assassinated, marginalized, deported out of Palestine and so forth. The only one who is qualified to speak of Palestinians and given the stage and the platform is that bad leadership. So, and that is the dichotomy we have to contend with. And this is the very purpose of the book. How do we move beyond this? How do we create that legitimate leadership, not necessarily via elections, because we know that Israel is not going to give Palestinians the space and the room to really create you know, democratic representatives. I mean, even when the even though the elections never even taken place, many Palestinian potential candidates were arrested anyway. Mm. So we know that either way, we will never have that moment. We need to have alternative ways in which we can have a legitimate leadership. And in within liberate within the framework of liberation movements, legitimate leadership does not necessarily have to be the outcome of the ballot box. There are other ways of achieving that. Mm, interesting. Well, of course, Ramsey, bad leadership isn't just confined to <laughs> top in Palestine. <laughs> Uh, we seem to have had quite a far fair share in this country for That's a number right. of decades now. But Ilan, I don't know. Are you still with us in Haifa? Yes, Hello. I am. Excellent. Time. I'm going to come to you because we've got a question. This is actually from Jeremy. I, I'm not quite sure where Jeremy uh, is, where he's sending his question in from. But he says um, this this possibly carries on from what uh, uh, Ramsey and Carla just been talking about. But he says uh, the proposed idea of the one state solution is what all the speakers, all of you, agree on. But what? Contra but that contradicts with Palestine's major political parties and thus with most of the Palestinian people. So how do you propose to overcome this problem? And how are you going to, to convince the Palestinians of the idea, uh, let alone the rest of the world? That's a big question. Yes, and, and, and a good one. Thank you for the question, Jeremy. Uh, might be Jeremy Corbyn, who knows? Uh, <laughs> yes, I would be surprised, actually. <laughs> he still supports the two-state solution, so <laughs> that might be a good question. Um, first of all, there's a difference between the factual part of the statement in the question that most of those who are now official leaders of the Palestinian, namely the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian members of the Israeli Knesset, to a certain extent the Hamas government, in Gaza, yes, they all subscribe to the two-state solution. But the second part of the statement, that because of that, uh, it means that uh, most of the Palestinian people support it. Uh, uh, I think Ramzi just explained to us very well how these leaders do not, and, and uh, Rada as well, uh, these people do not represent the majority of the Palestinian people. So I wouldn't say that by looking at the political current political position of either Palestinian members of Knesset uh, in Israel or the PA, we know what the majority of the Palestinian wish in terms of a one state or a two state solution. In fact, we, we have recently more and more surveys by professional uh, uh, units that show a growing uh, support for the Palestinian, uh, for the one state solution and a, a sharp decline in both support for the two state solution and even more importance. Uh, there is a majority of people in Palestine and Palestinians who don't believe that this is at all a, a, a feasible uh, solution. Uh, and most of the Palestinians see it as an Israeli attempt to, uh, uh, to substitute a direct occupation by some forms of indirect occupation of parts of historical uh, Palestine. So I think the issue is not uh, running into a collision with the official Palestinian uh, position uh, because of any, anyway, the problem with Palestinian uh, uh, official position was just explained. I think the main challenge is not that. The main challenge is indeed to find a way uh, of getting there. Uh, uh, intellectuals who are the, the main uh, body, but not the only one, but the main body of our book chart principles ideas, articulate them, uh, they are not the leaders, they don't claim to substitute substitute the future leadership, but I think there will be a leadership that would carry on 
uh, uh, this idea and would tell us and, and with us would find a way of how to, to implement it. Um, but I, I do agree, and I think that was part of the question, that a major step forward is to declare and to have a Palestinian declaration that the two-state solution is dead. It's dead. As I always say, it's been in the morgue for many, many years. We just don't dare to, to give it a funeral. Um, but it is uh, something that we should not waste too much energy on it. Uh, uh, you know, when Amnesty International frames Israel as a whole as an apartheid state, at least it's clear for everyone that we are now united in an anti-apartheid movement. That uh, if most uh, of the language used by both Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch and so many scholars around the world is of Israel as a settler colonial state, it's very clear that we're talking about decolonization. Decolonization, getting rid of apartheid, all this has nothing to do with a two-state solution. A two-state solution can only perpetuate these uh, criminal uh, political uh, realities. Uh, so, so I think we, we are beyond that in many ways. We, we, are, we are waiting for a Palestinian initiative and energy that would uh, bring forth uh, a representative body of leadership that will show us the way forward. But I think, as I said before, there is a unity of vision of liberation. It is yet to be translated, and I think Rada also said it, into a clear statement by the Palestinian leadership, by a, an authentic representative Palestinian leadership. And I think when this will happen, also the international community would get used to a different language, to a different vision. And I'm even optimistic that uh, not in a large number, but it will have a significant influence on at least a small group of Israeli Jews inside Israel who are also waiting in many ways to have a clear vision to which they can act bravely as anti-Zionists within the Jewish society in Israel. Well, thank you very much for that, Ilan. Uh, we are really down to our last few minutes. So I wanted to come back to Garda, if I may, and um, before we finish, and, and also to Ramsey, um, because key to the book uh, is the idea, essentially, of people speaking out, offering opinions that controversial sometimes, may offend some, may enthuse others, uh, may have an enormous effect. Um, we hope so. But at the same time, uh, there is, and I just say this out of interest because at a different life, I've just been marking a thesis from a former Palestinian journalist who's taken upon himself to try and update the ethics code for the Palestinian press and media. Um, and he talks about some of the issues that he's, uh, that journalists face uh, in Palestine, in historic Palestine, the, the problems they have with the Israeli censors, but also uh, censorship and uh, problems they have from the Palestinian Authority and Hamas as well. So how important is it, uh, and especially now with the power of social media, which we've seen, um, and this to you, God, I mean, how important is it to establish at the very heart of all of this, a real freedom of the press of the media in Palestine? Because surely that has got to be one of your greatest natural allies. Definitely, <clears throat> definitely, it's crucial. <clears throat> but we know very well what all this is about. Uh, it's about uh, the Israeli campaign and a very powerful campaign, I must say, to uh, uh, silence the Palestinian voice uh, and to deprive it of any opportunity of telling what it sees, telling the story, um, and it's it's not to be it's not to be underestimated this this is a very very big barrier um that doesn't mean that uh, palestinians don't uh, make the effort and don't do that don't set up um, a, a situation a group an organization which tries to get find ways around that um, and you know what is very, very um, uh, daunting for Palestinians as well is not only is Israel engaged in this, but Israel's allies are engaged in it as well. So, you know, even if one can, uh, can see why Israel would not want to be bad-mouthed or be criticized by anyone, uh, 
it is truly extraordinary in this situation that all its friends apparently support it in this in this aim, as we know very well. No, no, it's extremely important because, look, what we're talking about in the end and what I think this book is about is the Palestinian voice, what Edward Said called permission to narrate, that Palestinians must tell their story and they must do it freely and they must feel able to express controversial ideas and to tell the truth. That's what this is about. And the best way that we can find to do that through mainstream media, through social media, that is the way forward. Thank you very much, Garda. I'm going to actually come to you, Ramsey, for the for the final word. And um, I'm just going to go back to actually a discussion that we had quite recently, which was the way in which the Western media, and I'm, this is a very broad uh, statement, by the way, but Western media in general, Western political leaders in general, have reacted to the invasion and occupation of Ukraine. Um, and the powerful arguments that have been marshaled against that for support of international law, for support for the International Criminal Court, <laughs> remarkably, given the United States never signed up to it. Um, but this, what's become so apparent is that is the, is the double standards now, just because when we're talking about the occupation of a fifth of Ukraine now by Russia, uh, this has taken place over a matter of a month or so. The occupation of, of Palestine has continued, well, since the Balfour Declaration onwards, effectively. So how do you think this clear dichotomy, this clear hypocrisy, if you like, is mobilizing opinion around the world and how can palestinians and many of those who contributed to your book use those arguments last time i checked i think the uh, number of western sanctions in russia has amounted to something like 7600 plus and we couldn't uh push these very western institutions to carry out a single meaningful sanctions against Israel for the last 75 years. Now, this tells us that there's something terribly problematic in this equation. And, and it's either A, we Palestinians have been so bad at this, and that is not the case at all. We are, we have been advocating and, you know, for Palestine, pushing, creating networks, working with various you know, marginalized, oppressed groups all over the world. We have very strong and powerful voices in, in many parts of the world, in universities, in UN uh, uh, bodies and institutions, yet we still could not get a single uh, sanctions imposed on Israel, even uh, in, in symbolic areas, for example, in the, within the sports community. We couldn't get the FIFA to uh, remove uh, particular Israeli racist Israeli teams operating from within illegal Jewish settlements like Bitar Jerusalem, for example, whose favorite chant is death to the Arabs. And we have been told time and time again, sports and politics do not mix. And suddenly in the case of Ukraine and Russia, everything is mixing including not just sports but food and novels and music and tennis play and everything and and they are not they don't even feel the need to defend it or the need to explain themselves um one particular um uh, eu figure who has been granted a new post in israel answered that question in a recent conference and i don't want to name names because it was a private meeting where he said well um let's accept it let's accept the fact that well russia has nuclear weapons and we as europe are living an existential threat therefore we have to behave differently in both of these situations so is it hypocrisy and and double speak yeah but i think it goes a bit deeper than that it's very clear that this assessment by many palestinians that we are not just fighting israel mm. we are also fighting western imperialism western neo-colonialism in palestine and pretending otherwise is just wasting everybody's time now it doesn't mean we stop advocating for palestine within western institutions yes we do but we should do this with the prior knowledge that this is just not about us 
articulating a strong case. And once we do so, everybody is just going to line up and support Palestine left and right. We have to push, we have to lobby, we have to work within civil societies of these countries to put pressures on their institutions, on their governments, to force them finally come to terms that Israel is a settler colonial apartheid regime and it cannot be supported. Western taxpayers' money cannot go to fund the war machine that is making apartheid and military occupation and, oppres and the oppression of Palestinians a reality. Thank you, Ramsey. Thank you, Ramsey. Well, today uh, I've been with uh, Ramsey, I've been with Garda and with Ilan in Haifa, and we've been discussing their book, Our Vision for Liberation. I should look into the right camera when I do this. Please do go out, get a, get yourself a copy. The launch is on Friday. I've actually got the publisher here, I believe, uh, Clarity Press, for those who want to order this book. Can people get this online? They can get it online. They can order it from Clarity Press. They can order it from, uh, of course, from Amazon, and they can also order it via various independent bookstores in the UK and the rest of Europe. Lovely. So there you have it from the author. And by the way, I'm sure the authors would be happy to sign it. Although, Ilan, you'll have to send your autograph in from Haifa. Look, thank you so much, Ramsey and Garda, here in the studio in London. This is a first for us, by the way, to be in a studio in London. We'll have to do more of it. And thank you also, Ilan, if you're still with us in Haifa. Uh, and until next time, thank you also to all of those who sent in questions, made your points. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of you. And to thank also our colleagues at Palestine Deep Dive for making this happen. So until next time, thank you. And thank you also to our guests.